Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. My name is John Braden. We are a progressive on-air dialogue on culture, politics, and the critical issues of our time. And tonight we're uh, very happy to be broadcasting from the Hoboken waterfront, the beautiful Hoboken waterfront. And we have a painter with us, an artist by the name of Bill Kern. And Bill, his pieces are part of a show called The Murals on the Fence Project, which is sponsored by uh, Jerry Fallow. She is the administrator of the City Cultural Affairs Department in Hoboken and the Toll Brothers uh, Corporation. Um, but I just stumbled upon this one day, Bill. I was on my way to my one of my favorite cafes over here where I like to do some journal writing and stuff and it was one morning and I looked up and the light was just coming in like it was just so perfect. It was very fresh and crisp, and I'm on the waterfront, and I look, and I see these gorgeous, gorgeous paintings here, you know, and I was really very, very stunned by that, and I said, boy, that's great. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I can get one of the artists to come and talk about it? So, Bill, uh, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, introduce yourself to our audience, and talk a little bit about your work that's here, and about, because we want to learn about art. You know, our, our show is an educative show. I'm a teacher, and if we can have creative people come on the show and talk about their process and and show some beautiful images then I think this will be a very good thing for our society today so Bill uh, here's your chance to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your art uh, well thank you very much John for inviting me yes. to uh, talk about uh, this project um, and that was such a beautiful beautiful description on how you uh, stumbled <laughs> upon these uh, paintings I'm grateful to be part of a, a number of artists who were selected to show their work a um, uh, brief history is I've been in Hoboken for 30 years um, and I've seen a lot of changes um, as we all have um, but one thing I think that hasn't changed is the beauty that surrounds us uh, and the basic stuff could be uh, green grass, uh, green trees and the blue sky. Um, I come from Long Island um, and I'm grateful that because I live here in Hoboken, that there still is beauty all around us. And I think that is the um, uh, essence of my work. I love nature, and some of the paintings that were chosen for the um, Art Along the Fence project was um, images of the landscape with buildings. Um, nature really talks to me. Um, it can begin with a maybe a little sketch similar to you seeing something on my daily walks and then I may go home and develop it even more in color or hopefully uh, come back with my canvas and easel and start adding some color to canvas. So uh, again, I appreciate your interest in my work and uh, please enjoy the paintings. Let's take a look at them. Let's take a look at the first one here. Uh, does this one have a name? Obviously that we could see buildings and I love the combination of the green trees and the building and the blue sky. It's just a wonderful sort of an urban but it's not so antiseptic that you know you have green and nature around you. Some urban settings are very cold and barren, and but this is kind of a homey, cozy urban setting. Can you talk a little bit about this piece? Uh, certainly. This piece is called View from Studio. Um, I remember it was done in uh, 2005, a view from my studio. Um, I believe it was done in the spring. That's why you're getting the, the green of the middle tree. Uh, the essence of a pink and some other tree kind of a pink brownish orange. Um, Hoboken has the most beautiful cherry blossoms, these gorgeous explosion of pink that happens every spring here in Hoboken. That's true. Yes. Um, I think what caught me was the mixture of nature kind of exploding mm. from a cold winter and with the buildings and part of the, the sky showing through. Which buildings is that? Is that the Newman Leather Building? Uh, unfortunately, those buildings are no longer there. Oh. I believe another building was built uh -huh. um, kind of in front of it. So that scene is no longer there, but it was a um, subject matter that, I, that spoke to me very often that I tried to capture in many different mediums, not, o not only oil on canvas, what you're seeing. Beautiful, beautiful. But let's take a look at the next 
Next piece here with, oh, the yellow is just absolutely gorgeous. And this looks like a park of some kind. Is this true? Um, believe it or not, it's the side of City Hall. It's ah. also done in the spring. They have the most gorgeous landscaped area of all these uh, shrubbery growing throughout the year. And this was Forsythia that blooms every year in the spring. And as you can see, how could you not oh my God. Get, get it, let it get your attention by that fiery yellow? And you know, it's funny because our show, we like to cover politics also, but in a very positive way, we like to emphasize the politics of love and caring. And I belong to an organization called the Network of Spiritual Progressives, and we're fighting for a new bottom line in our culture that values not only expanding money and power, but also expanding love and kindness and caring and generosity. And one of our platforms is we would like to uh, expand a sense of awe and wonder at the beauty of the natural world, because we like to educate for that you know and this really does it I mean and there's City Hall right behind that you think of City Hall you think of politics you think of backroom deals and and that kind of thing and here you see just the wonder and beauty of nature surrounding that that political stuff that's also going on how long did it take you to do this um, I believe John this painting um, is uh, 11 inches by 14 inches oil on canvas again. I believe I worked on it two or three sittings, meaning I would work on it maybe a half hour, then look at it. And I remember a city hall worker came by and said, not bad, and I, I got kind of encouragement to oh. keep trucking. So I oh think God. it was uh, two or three sittings that I did that painting in. That's a great song, right? Keep on trucking, baby, from the 1970s, a Motown, a Motown song. So you got a little encouragement from the city hall worker. Yes, as oh. we do when we okay. uh, are visible out there in working in the world, oh. people are uh, interested in what artists are doing. Yes. So I welcome them coming up and taking a peek and getting feedback from them. One of the things about Bill I notice he's a very friendly person, he smiles a lot, he says hello to you on the street and that in itself I think is very very important today. I think we have a lot of alienation in our society and a lot of people walk by each other and they have the iPods coming out of their ears you know and just going from point A to point B and they're not looking around, they're not taking in the beauty around them. Uh, Robert Putnam wrote a book called Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community and he says that the mental health of a community is best measured not by how many friends you have, but how many people you can stop and have a brief chat with on the street. And you're the kind of guy who you can do that with. You can say hello to and, you know, you're open to connection. And that, to me, is a very rare quality that we're losing in our society. So I can see you have the artistic uh, uh, competence, but also you have a social competence, which is very, very important. We'd like to acknowledge that on our show. Um, let's take a look at this uh, last piece over here. Uh, Bill. And now one of your heroes I, I noticed reading in your biography was Van Gogh. And I suddenly got a sort of a vision of a Van Gogh, I don't know why, maybe the barn or something, the country. Wh where was this taken and what was this? Again, this is a view from, um, I'd like to say actually from the street, but it's actually a, a view from one of my windows in oh. my apartment wow. of a shed in the backyard. Um, I have um, something about snow really talks to me. I think snow is very interesting for me to paint because when it snows, um, it kind of simplifies things. Like there's a white color and then if it's a shed, it's orange. Or if it's a car, maybe it's blue, what isn't covered. So I think snow simplifies uh, shapes and colors. So I think as a subject matter, snow I really love. Yeah. I teach privately. Okay. My, my website is billcurrent.com net if anyone would like to see more of my work but uh, again snow something about snow really talks to me and something about sheds um, it's interesting you said Van Gogh Van Gogh is one of my favorite painters um, something about his passion for the outside world speaks to me and his connection with with the with the natural world I also admire in him but also uh, my favorite painter is Fairfield Porter who also worked outside and um, really was re receptive to the natural world. Um, uh, another artist to check out. As we talk, let's back up a little bit because we want to get the images, these other other images. We want Claudia, maybe nice. Claudia can go sort of back and forth and continue to capture the beauty of these, both of these paintings here as we continue our discussion because these are the kind of conversations that go deeper and as you, as you know, we get into a dialogue, uh, we can really 
sort of learn and share with our audience, you know, something about your process, something about the, you know, why why is art important, you know, because living in a society that's become more functional and, and you know, the economics of the situation also is that uh, people focusing on a very reductionist bottom line and, 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 and neglecting art. I think we, we're trying to bring art, you know, keep art alive and the importance of art and aesthetics. And uh, you, you studied at Parsons? And you studied at the Art Students League, and you also studied at the SVA, the School of Visual Arts. What were some of the things you learned in school? And you also worked in business for a while. It's very interesting. Bill, uh, for 17 years, was an art director for Lord & Taylor. That's correct. That's a very big corporate job, you know, and you were the illustrator and you were the art director. Yeah. So what was it like to go into corporate America and then come out and find yourself as an artist again? Because a lot of people now, you know, they, they want to be artists, but they, you need to make a living, you know, you need to put food on the table. How does that work, that connection between, you know, money and art? Um, all good questions, John. Um, yes, I did go to uh, school for advertising design, and uh, when I graduated, I came to the city, and that's where I got more involved with uh, the fine art. And I think by taking those art classes at those schools that you mentioned, I got um, more exposed to uh, museums and fine artists, and I really learned that I was not only a, a commercial artist but also a, 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 a budding fine artist and that's where I started to put brush to canvas and um, yes I was an art director and illustrator uh, at Lord & Taylor for 16 years. Uh, it was wonderful to have full page ads in the New York Times. Wow. Um, that was quite quite impressive. Oh my. And I remember a friend always saying, Bill, uh, how do you, uh, how, are you, how are you so loose in your painting when, you know, when you go into the, the, the job, the nine to five, you're, you're, it's very structured and kind of uh, tight. Well, you know, maybe I could do both. I could loosen up with the art, but then be tighter when I would have to do a layout for fashion or something like that. But something else I just wanted to point out, uh, in 1986, when one of the first times I showed here in Hoboken, uh, thanks to Jerry Fallow at City Hall, who works with the Culture Affairs Department and she runs all the cultural and arts um, uh, projects. Uh, I said, uh, down all the side streets, people have wonderful hidden um, gardens. It's still true today. Yes. People have wonderful hidden gardens down mm. all the side streets if you look, and that has been an inspiration uh, for my whole time here, which is 30 years plus. So, if you could be in an urban setting, because people love to be in an urban situation because of the creativity and the diversity and the social advantages to living in an urban environment, but the disadvantages you get disconnected from nature. So, how do you put those two together? Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, and I thought about you. I mean, I thought about Thoreau when I read your biography. That uh, Thoreau said that uh, he wrote an essay called "Walking," and he said that people who live in cities, he says, have to get out at least 15, 20 minutes a. Day Day, to keep your sanity, you need to go out in the woods or find some sort of a you know a bucolic setting where you can just go and, and meditate or just walk. You, you meditate by walking, you know, and that's why like you know we we're, we're very. I'm a critic of cars. I'm a critic of our car culture, and I think I think Hoboken is a very walkable city. And it's almost, you can think that Hoboken is like a model for the country now, because as we move into a green economy and with more biking and things like that, what's great about Hoboken, how, how are you a real walker, right? Tell us a little like bit about your, about your walking life here in Hoboken. Um, well, my walking life is very alive. I walk every day. There's a beautiful college campus here called Stevens Institute, oh, yes. which has the most breathtaking uh, views of Manhattan from Hoboken, but the most beautiful grounds, uh, one of the most beautiful grounds of Hoboken to walk. Um, and, as, as I, and as I was saying before, I get a lot of my ideas by just walking and seeing a, a tree down this street or a, a plant on a window in this apartment down this street. So there is beauty no matter where you look in Hoboken. It's the idiosyncrasy of it. Uh, 
uh, there's an anthropologist by the name of Clifford Geertz, and I was just reading this where he said that it's important to have a sense of community knowledge, to know the doors and the windows, you know, and, and the people on the corner, that there's a sort of a, an epistemology of that. There's a kind of, and we're, you know, we seem to be losing that now with everybody staring at these iPods and not looking and noticing the particularities around them and the beauty around them. Uh, you, you are actually quoted as saying that you would like your art to help people notice the beauty around them. I think that's wonderful. Do you have a lot of conversations, Bill, when you walk around the street? What's it like in terms of, you know, your, you know, seeing people you know? What, what, what is that whole experience like? Because, you know, New Yorkers are watching us and everybody in New York is so in a hurry to get somewhere and, oh, rush, 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 get out of my way. And, and even sometimes in Hoboken it gets like that. You know that? You really, some of those habits, those bad habits. And it's, I, I think it's not people's fault. I don't want to blame people. I want to blame the society. One of the things I advocate for, and when I ran for president last year, Bill, I don't know if you know that I ran for president of the United States I didn't get much coverage on TV so maybe you know you didn't hear I didn't I you know I got zero donations from corporations so you know it was tough to get the word out but one of my one of my promises was I was I was advocating for a 25 hour work week because I think the fact that people are so overworked who has time who has time to really devote to study art to look around, to be relaxed and peaceful, to be in community, to read. So that's another thing, you know. And I'm just, I'm really happy that you uh, chose to spend some time with us. And uh, could you maybe say a little something to inspire our audience members who maybe feel that they have a creative side to them? You know, a lot of people watching us sitting on the couch now, you know, maybe somebody was channel surfing and found us, you know, and they're like, oh, what is this? This is a different kind of show, what's going on, we have artists here now, but maybe, I, I happen to have a theory that everybody is an artist, we all have that potential, and if it's nurtured, how would you advise our budding painters or writers or, or you know, to, how, to get in touch with their creativity? That's a great question, John, and I agree with what you had mentioned before, that everyone is creative. Yeah. Um, um, what I, if I could just make a suggestion, which yeah. would be, to take 15 minutes a day when you get up in the morning. I heard someone say once That's okay. to, um, that she did a watercolor in the morning every day in the morning for 15 minutes. That was the first thing she did when she rolled out of bed because that way she can say she did her creativity ah. and it set her mind in this more creative, abundant, gratitude, uh, at peace mode that most of the times her day was wonderful. So, um, uh, and again, I agree that everyone is creative. Play with anything, with yeah. clay, with pencil, paper, with um, uh, watercolor, with oil, uh, bounce a ball, that can be creative. Uh, you know, for 15 minutes a day, I, I need to put in my 15 minutes when I finish this interview. <laughs> okay. Um, but 15 minutes a day wow. uh, will add up by keep doing those small increments of yeah. having fun and playing. Yes. Um, it, it adds up and uh, watch out what you might become because wow. being creative can be a very powerful exercise. It changes your life. It opens up it doors. Does. It does. Wow. Maybe paint a door. That could be a, a, an exercise. <laughs> paint a door, everybody, okay? Your homework assignment from, from Bill. Now, uh, Bill, uh, just, it just reminds me also because uh, Henry Miller, who also grew up in Brooklyn, and you're a Brooklyn boy, born and raised. Born in Brooklyn. So many, so many great artists and thinkers have come from Brooklyn. What is it about Brooklyn? I don't know. Henry Miller, who's also from Brooklyn, said that people who you know want to be creative and feel that you have to be practical too, as long as you can spend about four to five hours a week, he said, at your art. Or actually, he might have even said two or three hours as the minimum. To, to like a, I'm, I'm a writer and I feel like now I have to spend at least four hours a week on my writing because I'm also teaching and I work in real estate and do this TV show so I'm very very busy but let's go back to Brooklyn what was it like growing up in Brooklyn um, I, was it different than now or uh, unfortunately I don't have an honest answer for okay. you John because I was very young when we moved from there oh, okay okay but um, um, if I could just reiterate, for me, if I do 15 minutes of creativity a day, yes. it seems more doable than if I think one hour, two hours, three hours, or four hours in a week. So for me, I, I, I'm trying to keep it simple and 
get started with just 15. Okay. Um, but um, unfortunately, I don't have a answer to the Brooklyn. But then you went to Long Island. Which part of Long Island did you grow? I was on the South Shore. Was there water by you? There was. Two, yes, there was. Okay. I was surrounded by water. Oh. And I think that's why I'm very grateful that there's nature still left in Hoboken because yes. nature we were surrounded by in Long Island. The river is so gorgeous. You know, Claudia and I, we took a cab from the uh, path station up here and went along Frank Sinatra Drive and the water was just like, it was glimmering. It was just had a beauty to it that was just shimmering so, so beautifully. Claudia, let's take a look at the art one more time. I want to just give our audience one more. And the sun is starting to go down, so we might be losing some of the light. So if it's not as bright as it, as it could be, uh, at least our audience will get some sense of the beauty here of, of, of your images that you captured from, from what you saw, from the reality around you. Um, and uh, one of the quotes I love from John Dewey, who was a philosopher of education, and he said that the aesthetic is the opposite of the anesthetic. That the anesthetic is what puts us to sleep. And art, which is the opposite, is the aesthetic. It wakes us up. So being exposed to art, you know, from, from, from exposure to your paintings, for example, to, to artworks, to novels, to films, people can then come alive to the reality around them in a, in a deeper way that they're not somnolent, that they're not. And there's a lot of that in our society today. There's a lot of somnolence. There's a lot of routine and people just going through the motions of a job that maybe they don't like, you know. And art can break through that. It can give you what Virginia Woolf said, a moment of being. She said, artworks give me moments of being. And we like our audience to reflect on what artworks have given them moments of being, you know, whether it was a novel, whether it was a, a film or a painting, and certainly, you know, your your paintings here can can really give somebody a sense of the richness of the beauty around them. I was on a Hoboken bus recently. It was in the morning, and I was looking out the windows at just the sun. It was about eight o'clock in the morning, and and. Hoboken is beautiful, you know, when you go down Washington Street, the old brownstones and the fruit stands and the way the light is glimmering and shadows and every day is different. You know, you're looking at the world from a different perspective, there's different people outside, the light is hitting at a different angle, and I'm just like, like, whoa, like looking around and just getting high off this, and is it just me? But I'm looking around me and the other people around me on the bus, they have iPods, and they're looking at the iPod screen, and the one woman who was near me, she was looking at her iPod, but, and I looked at her expression, and she looked like annoyed or something. Like she looked like she was, she was, she was bored or something. Looking at her iPod, and I'm like, "Come on, folks, put the iPod down. Learn something about." art, learn something about the miracle of, of existence that we only go around once in this life, you know, and if you don't feel excited about life, then try to change change that, Or, but I think it's also connected to the society we live in and people, you know, who are not getting the art education that they should be getting in schools because they're cutting the budgets on art programs and they're pushing a very technocratic model that, you know, education has become training for work. We've been criticizing this on our show and they're taking art out. They should be, people should learn this stuff. They should learn about art. They should learn about culture. And, uh, but you're, you're, you're doing something about that. You're helping to repair this deficiency. So, you know, from a political standpoint, point, we, we, we applaud you. Thank you, John. From an aesthetic standpoint, we applaud you. And from a social standpoint, you're doing amazing, amazing work. Now I'm going to shut up because I've talked a lot. And I'm going to let you say whatever you'd like to say. And, uh, uh, okay, all right. A uh, final final reflection uh, on 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 art, on your work. Well, again, I appreciate you asking me to speak, and I um, I'm just grateful to be an artist and that I can uh, express my creative talents and. Uh, uh, do it in this beautiful world that we have here in Hoboken, New Jersey. And also New York has wonderful art galleries too. You know, we have a, we have a, we have a tri-state area here. We have a New York City metro area. So there's lots of opportunities for aesthetic encounters in New York and in Hoboken and all around us if you're alive to the beauty around you. And, and I think the dialogue is a part of it. So I'm learning just by talking to you, Bill. And I know our audience is also learning from the conversation. And the conversation will always go on because there's always more to say. We could always continue this conversation at a cafe, like my cafe over here, and we're trying to revive that cafe culture and, and conversation spirit that you bring on the street and that you've, you've brought to us tonight on our show. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank, thank you. you. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Okay.
Hi, we're back here in Hoboken at the Art Along the Fence mural project. Uh, it's a different day than yesterday when we interviewed uh, Bill Curran on his work here. And today, uh, on a cloudy day, different day, we have uh, Joseph Borzada with us. And Joseph has one piece here. Joseph is an incredible artist who has shown his work in Hoboken and New York City. And he has a piece here that's very interesting and it has a surrealistic element to it. And we're going to start our conversation now just by introducing Joseph and, 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 and how would you like to uh, talk about your work as we see it and what would you like people to think about this work? Mm. Well, I always try to create images where the, the viewer brings their own experiences and thoughts and emotions to the piece. Because a lot of times people get caught up, the average per person gets caught up. Mm when they're looking at art as, I don't understand it, or they don't know art history, and that's not always important. A lot of times it's looking at a piece, it's what, what do you feel, what uh, emotions, and it's something as simply, do you like it or hate it, and why? And it's all legit. It's, so it's, you don't have to bring that whole historical context necessarily to every piece. So I like to create images where the average person can bring, like I said, their own experiences and get to kind of their own interpretation. I leave little hints along the way and let them create their own story interpretation of it. Oh, yes. Let's take a look at the painting and let's focus up on it and uh, we see a woman here with blonde hair and her hair is like sticking straight up in the air and on top of her hair uh, there are these buildings and uh, it's definitely an urban setting. You can see the water tower. It's an iconic sort of a New York City shot. I had to actually take a closer look and when I noticed you see the top of Katz's Katz's Deli, which is a very famous Lower East Side uh, place for pastrami. It's been around for over a hundred years. <laughs> okay, um, and so you wonder, like, what it, what is happening here? Is she thinking of these things? Is it is it part of her imagination? Is she herself located in an urban setting, or maybe perhaps she's dreaming of moving to the city? Like, what are some of the impressions that may have been evoked by this by by people? Well, those questions you just said yes. are what I try to get exactly what I get the viewer to ask themselves yes. and I leave it up to them now oh. this this piece is titled Loi Saida uh, oh, L -O okay. L -O -I -S -A -I -D -A, which is oh. Spanglish for Lower East Side or Lower East Sider oh. um, okay. and I lived there for for a number of years like on the Lower East Village and I had a bar in the Lower East Side oh. and uh, so I yes. really really love the area that's the other thing about uh, Joe, is that Joe was a bar owner uh, both here in Hoboken. He owned a place called the Liquid Lounge, which was, I think, in the heyday of Hoboken as a music mecca. Uh, now we see they just closed Maxwell's. It's kind of a sad, you know, what, what do you think about the closing of Maxwell's? You know, it's a sad, it's yeah. a sad thing, but I think it's, it's, I think they had a really long, good, solid run, yeah. and it's just, uh, unfortunately, it's gentrification and yeah. things change, cities change demographics change. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have to try to keep alive that aesthetic element, and you've done that in the past. Yeah. And so, uh, your experience, do you think that living in the Lower East Side somehow uh, affected your consciousness in a way that maybe led to the creation of this uh, this painting? Well, this, it's, this whole series of paintings of stuff going on in people's hair yeah. is, uh, I'm a people watcher and I'm always fascinated by looking at people and thinking about what's what's their story, what's their deal, what what are they what are their ups and downs, how do they deal with the ups and downs of their daily life, what are their burdens, their thoughts, their dreams. And um, you know, their their environments that they live in, are they do they create their own environment or are they forced to live in that environment? And, and by environment I mean it could be physical environment or mental emotional environment. So all those things you were asking before, whether that's an actual city on her head or her thoughts or her dreams or imagination are yes. what I'm trying to open up. It's interesting because the forced environment, when you think about now, one of the things we've been talking about on our show is how we like to educate people for uh, you know, not not to think in terms of practical terms, in terms of always making a living. Obviously, we do have to make a living, but you know, nowadays I'm an educator, and I notice that in the education field, they're moving away from art education, mm. and they're sort of like implementing this very practical approach to teaching and learning, where uh, it's all about uh, you know uh, connecting uh, education 
to training for work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and, and it's very, this sort of lack of humanity with that. So if people go through that process and they find themselves working at a job, a corporate job, sitting in a cubicle, how are they really in control of their destiny mm -hmm. or, or not? You know, so these are just some of the things that come up when you think about that. Let's read, there's some text here that's, that goes with the work here. And I want to read this text because I think it can give us more to think about and talk about. As I feel raindrops, it just started to rain, but I, thi I, I think we might be able to get this segment in before it really comes down. Uh, this says, Joseph Borzada, painter. These images explore people's relation to society and themselves. How connected are they to what is happening around them or right on top of them? Well, literally for her, it's right on top of her with this city. Okay. The paintings are partially a visual exploration into existentialism analyzing existence and, f and the freedom, responsibility, and isolation of the individual. Are they in environments that they created or are forced to live in? The viewer brings their own insights and experiences for unique conclusions. So that's basically what you were saying, how every person brings their own take to what's going on here. Uh, and in terms of freedom, I mean, how free do you think people are today in terms of, you know, when you look at the economy and having to struggle to make a living? How, as an, how did you develop as an artist and think about these in terms of these economic issues? Uh, uh, I'm trying to stumble my way toward a question here. You know, you have, we have the gentrification going on in Hoboken, and we have people moving out, artists moving out. How is it possible to live a creative, fulfilling life um, and still put food on the table and, 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 and have a sense of freedom? Sartre once said, I think, Sartre, you talk about existentialism there, and Sartre said that a work of art is has to do with freedom because it's the faith and the freedom of the artist to create it and also in the viewer to interpret the meaning that they're going to get from it. So that's an existential concept. Um, and uh, what, what is the state of the art world today and your take from an artist's standpoint? Well, m making art and making money has always been the million dollar question, you know, for it's, it's, it's never really uh, been answered. For me, I came from a commercial art background. I originally went to school for um, graphic design. I've done illustration. Okay. So I kind of have that sensibility and I mesh that in with fine art so in terms of just knowing how to market get myself out there get the work out there um, I have that background uh, fine art majors I don't know I'm not familiar with the programs in schools I would hope that they you know whenever I I have I've taught in the past um, at uh, some colleges and I've always said like have something else going on like if for illustration majors I would say learn graphic design so you can make money in between assignments and you can survive mm -hmm. and um, you know it's 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 very difficult for for people in fine arts because you need a place to live and you need room to work mm -hmm. so and yeah. while you're in your studio making a sculpture or a painting yeah. you're not necessarily generating cash by the time you're doing in there so it's it's always a juggling act I had a really uh, dear friend Estella Lackey who was who died a few years ago unfortunately she was a super talented sculptor and her studio used to be across from mine in in Hoboken where was your studio in Hoboken on uh, Monroe Street I've it's been there for like 20 years yes. and um, I remember one time she came over and we were talking and she was all frustrated yeah. because she did a lot of temp work okay and she said you know when I'm doing temp work all I can think about is getting back to the studio. She says, and then when I'm in the studio, I get distracted because I'm worried about how I'm going to pay my bills. And that um, sums it up. So that's the dilemma, I think, for a lot of artists. Now, how now I think there's, with the internet, there's so many more opportunities. Um, but you're asking to her before about economic freedom, but yeah, yeah. the cost of life has gotten so much more expensive. Um, so it's, it's it's a really uh, tricky way to deal with. I think everybody's going through that. Um, for artists, um, there's there's a lot of freedom with with the internet and, and computers and the ability to do things. But then you know you have that whole all the revelations about the NSA and wow. looking about censoring and and uh, getting involved with the internet. So exactly. it's always <laughs> there's always something to contend with. I'm thinking now also, uh, Joe, about the social aspect of art and the dialogue, because we're having a wonderful dialogue here. And I'm looking at your work here. And what, what's the name of this uh, piece? Loisida. 
Low East Side, Low East Side, okay. And Low East Side is a very, very cool, very sort of a happening, very artistic place. There's a lot of art galleries there now. And you were there during what time period? Uh, to, uh, 2004, 2006 is when I had the, the okay. bar open. It was just starting to really become a mecca, I think, for this kind of creative yeah. energy. Now, I'm just imagining, like, right now, I had this vision of people sitting in a circle here, a group of people, with that paint, with your painting there, and just having a discussion and referring to the work and then going back to the dialogue. And really, because it could be so rich if you look at the layers of meaning that could come out of this in terms of imagination. Is she, is she, is she dreaming? Is she wondering? Is she, you know, uh, I think many people, many of our viewers are trying to dream of a, of a better world, a better life that's more filled with art. But I think a lot of people are confused about art. You know, people people see some people see an abstract painting or a surreal painting, and unless you have knowledge, unless you know something about that, how what is surrealism? You know, who was Salvador Dali? Who was Picasso? Why did they create these images that were different than naturalistic landscapes? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, talk a little bit about your own education and how you came upon art history. Um, well, I've always been making art. My older brother used to always buy me uh, art history books from when I was pretty young. So, so I was always kind of looking at everything from okay. uh, Raphael and Da Vinci to Marvel Comics. And, oh uh, so I was always yes. interested in like the visual part of art. Yes. Art history came from those books. Okay. And uh, I had some good art teachers in high school who got us. Where was art. high school? Wayne Valley High School, in Wayne, you, New Jersey. You grew up in Wayne. Yeah. Now that's interesting because I taught college at William Patterson University oh, okay. yeah. back about 2005, 2006, and up uh, the bus would go up the hills, rolling mm -hmm. hills, and the be beautiful campus, beautiful. Yeah, it's right down. Uh, William Patterson's right down the road from Valley. Oh, yeah. And uh, and then of course when I went to art school, there was required art history courses and. Uh, mm -hmm. Just my own natural curiosity about about things. Wow. What's the state of art on television today? I mean, uh, there are some shows like we we love Charlie Rose. Mm -hmm. I think that he you know he goes out of his way to feature some important you know playwrights and, and artists. But the general fair and primetime TV. What is the state you think of aesthetic education in our country? Whether it's on the media or whether it's in the schools. Mm -hmm. Where's this guy John who has this great cable access? Oh, oh me? Oh, thank you, Joseph. That's very nice of you. That's very kind of you. Okay. But again, I, I think yes. it's, uh, I think there's a lot going on. And Besides, Claudia. Claudia. Claudia is my co-producer, of course. Yes. Claudia. Doesn't happen without Claudia. Okay. You know, years ago, it was basically public access. And oh. now there's podcasts, there's YouTube. Uh, anybody can post up uh, a blog mm. or post up a, a video. Um, so I think there's a lot out there. There's a lot of information out there. Um, there's and there's also a lot of shows with you know there's a thousand cable channels. Okay. So there's always well it's 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 good and bad. You know you get <laughs> you get some of those shows on Bravo about the art world which are just horrible you and and, okay. and not, you know they're silly. They're they're <laughs> and, you know silly entertainment. But then you get some on uh, public television that has some uh -huh. amazing okay. documentaries and shows about. Uh, kind of like what you're doing, going around different aspects of the art. So there, it's out there. It's, there's a lot more out there. We're trying to get people to be less afraid of art, too. I think there is a fear because if you look at the history of the art world, a lot of art has been associated with powerful people, with the rich and famous. I mean, for years before they had museums, if you wanted to see a beautiful painting, you had to go to the house of a castle of a rich person to see it. So people still have that little bit of fear, that little bit of genuflecting, you know. And how can we overcome that? And, and what, what, uh, what, what has been people's reaction to, to your work in terms of, you know, like, dislike, confusion? or anything uh, it, it runs the gamut okay. you know uh, some people just scratch their head and say well, what the hell's that about you know and then some people come up and, and will get some really amazing uh, interpretations of it so what more can you ask for to get both those reactions, oh, it's that's, great. That's beautiful. Now, now, Joe, as a person situated both in the Hoboken art scene and also in New York, because you've exhibited in, in New York. Park. In Asbury Park. Oh, yeah. Claudia just got back. Uh, we were at Asbury Park two weeks ago. Yeah. My parents have a house in Ocean Grove. We visited them, walk over the bridge, and there's right. Asbury Park scene is incredible. Cookman Avenue right. really has it's come really, along. Really uh, oh. come a long way. It's, it's amazing. 
What are some of the differences between the Hoboken scene or the Jersey scene and the New York scene? Is there still a kind of a snobbery there? Is there still that little bit of a, that like, you know, New York is kind of this she-she place that is very hard to get to and, and, and it's, because uh, you, you sort of have been a way to master both of those domains. How, how, do, how do you? Well, New York is still the place. You, there, you know, you have the Met, you have the major museums, you have uh, lots of major big and small galleries. Uh, you go to Chelsea and there's, you have Gagosian and you go to Lower East Side and then you yeah. got some small little storefront sure. galleries and um, yeah, yeah. there's some really amazing work in, mm. in both those types of places. Yeah. Um, as far as Hoboken's changed, it's, it's uh, with yeah. the rising rents, you yeah. know, back when I had uh, Liquid Lounger was a lot more artists and yeah. writers and musicians here and just, you know, gentrification, just reality set in and the uh, rents went up and it kind of dispersed. There's still um, an arts community here at the Newman Leather Building and oh. Monroe Building. There's there's still a, a community here, mm. which I'm very happy about. Struggling, mm. but still still hanging in there. Mm. Um, and then you have places, uh, you have pockets around around the area. Yeah. Asbury Park is certainly certainly okay. starting to become one. And what, Claudia and I love the Jersey City art scene because they have a wonderful tour every October mm -hmm. where people open up their homes and we walk around. And it's actually, I think, more, much more extensive now than Hoboken. Yeah. The, the Jersey City uh, studio tour and Hoboken studio tour are still, mm -hmm. I mean, they're over 20, 25 years they've been doing them. And uh, yeah, Jersey's, Jersey City's really, it's, it's a huge city. And um, there's there's several pockets of, of art and some buildings opening up and uh, downtown's really gotten revitalized. There's a lot of, you know, the gentrification process. A lot of little bars and restaurants opening. There's artists coming into the area, came into the area, and and it's it's definitely a thriving area. Now I want to go back. I want to focus back on the painting on Low East Side, yes. and Joe, I want you to think about some of the meanings that. Uh, come for you in this painting in terms of when you were doing it in terms of right now at this moment in terms of the shifting interpretations and uh, do you think that there's part of you in this woman in some way? Or? Um, yeah you know there's like I said I kind of like to leave it open to people's okay. individual interpretations sure, but sure. Uh, I think most artists you, you saw uh, your, your environment your thoughts creep into your work some, sometimes when you don't even realize it mm. and certainly uh, uh, that was where I used to walk by Katz's Deli every okay. day, you know, okay. and uh, and that area was very, very much a part of my uh, my life. New York is, uh, yeah, oh. <laughs> Hoboken parking. Yes, Hoboken park. We have a Hoboken parking situation transpiring. Am I blocking you in? Uh, okay, yeah. hold. We could we could stop it okay. and then we'll continue. Okay. okay. When the red light, okay, see the, the, the car was double parked, Joe just had to move his car. We're not going to edit this out because we want to leave it in to show you the existential reality of Hoboken <laughs> That's parking. Perfect you know. example of how Hoboken has changed, you know, these yuppie knuckleheads who are like, you know, I got to get to lunch, that's oh all that counts, God. you know. <laughs> Forget about the art, right? Forget about the art. And I think that's the real reason why Maxwell's closed, uh, yeah, because you have people in town now who have not been aesthetically educated. Yeah. And I don't like to blame them because a lot of people, they, you know, feel like they have to major in business in order to make a living. But as a result, they're actually jipping themselves out of that aesthetic appreciation and living a life that's much more narrower. Their yeah. consciousness is much more narrower, you know, going from work to home with the iPods on, and they're not having an existential encounter with the natural world because of their because of a deficiency in knowledge about art and I think that's really the I, my, my own reflection that's why that's why Maxwell's closed because you don't you're not having a community of people who have that rich intelligence that creative intelligence maybe they have a financial education but a financial education is not an aesthetic education yeah. and it's not an historical education or an intellectual education and in a way you can almost say that we're moving into an anti-intellectual society which is uh, kind of barbaric also in a way, you know, but the artists are keeping alive culture, are keeping alive some sort of sense of humanity, you know, what do you think? Well, I, I things shift. Mm -hmm. Things always change, especially cities are always evolving. Yeah. And where Hoboken, Hoboken is right now yeah. is a lot of the artsier venues had a, were starting to have a tougher time because mm. people like this guy, Want to go angry? He had an angry look in his face. <laughs> you know, they want to go sit in a bar with 20 screens while playing TV and yes. you know pop music playing and oh. 
you know, eating sliders, and that's in Coors Light, and that's all they're really. Okay. Might not supposed to mention brand names. That's but, horrible. Um, no, you can mention Coors. We hate Coors because okay. Coors was founded by, uh, well, Joseph Coors was a person who financed the Heritage Foundation, yeah. which is a right-wing think right tank, which, which has helped to propagandize this idea that the free market is, is, is the be-all, end-all, and that you can't have regulations on business. You have to cut taxes on wealthy people. That's the Heritage Foundation, founded by the Coors family. Now, when I found that out, I switched to Budweiser immediately. <laughs> so it's okay to, you know, say that. But yeah, when I walk into a bar and I see 20 screens and it's loud and it's it's like I walk right out I mean there's nothing aesthetic about that there's a wonderful bar in Williamsburg Brooklyn that I like once in a while because they have like two little screens above the bar and they show old movies mm -hmm. and they show old like TV sitcoms but they keep the volume off mm -hmm. and they have jazz music playing it's much more much more aesthetic kinda like the liquid lounge mm -hmm. atmosphere I think I think uh, what was that like being a bar owner because that is like a very social space we like social things on our show and was there a lot of interesting conversations that happened there yeah um, uh, yeah I mean that was also uh, it was a business for me, but it was also, I looked upon it as like a, this 24-hour art installation. Oh. You know, it was, uh, wow. it was always, I loved the challenge of mm. only come, trying to come up with new things and keep it interesting. We had a gallery, we had figure drawing, we mm. had open mic. I only booked original bands. Mm. Um, you know, and at, uh, at the time, there was a, a, a niche to be filled because a lot of the artsy venues in town had closed or changed owners. And... So there was that, but I could have opened, you know, a yuppie Irish bar and made a fortune right out of the gate, but that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, I could have booked cover bands and had a line out the door, um, mm -hmm. but that's not what I wanted to do. Yes. And um, to get back to your question before you were saying yeah. about going into bars, you know, the, the big screen TVs and all that is fine. You know, they're making money. Yeah. That's great. And... But it's boring, isn't it boring? How, how are these people not bored sitting there? Is that all they know about? Well, to tie that know. back into art, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't think they're bored. I think they're that's their scene, that's, that's, their, their, thing. that's their thing. And, you know, it's just like, uh, like I said, to bring it back to art, yeah. not all art is for everybody. There are okay. some people that get really excited by a, a, a white canvas with a, a dot in the middle or something like that to take it to an extreme right, but there are people right. that get r really jazzed about stuff like that sure. um so you know uh, desperate housewives is you have another crowd who goes for that right yeah uh, you know it's <laughs> styles fashions tastes okay. are always evolving and changing okay it's better to be non non-judgmental about this stuff you try to be, you know. Uh, I don't. It's, okay. it's it's difficult it's to a struggle. Human nature. You have your likes and, and dislikes mm -hmm. in in television and art and food and everything else. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the painting one more time. And I'm trying to think about this woman here and what's going through her mind. Uh, maybe she possibly could be living in the suburbs and dreaming of a of a city existence. But but you know she has a look of concern on her face. Like you know maybe she you know maybe she couldn't afford an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> in the city, like you know, or or uh, is is you know, I don't know. I mean, this is uh, the, the context of a lot of these paintings here on the wall. Here, you have scenes of nature and urban urbanism as well, sort of contrasting. And and uh, but uh, now, growing up in, in in Wayne, you said right, yeah. Wayne was a suburban town. Mm -hmm. And did you dream of the big city? Was it was it your dream to one day make it in New York? As Frank Sinatra says, if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. No, I was actually uh, pretty pretty afraid of New York oh, uh, okay. at the time growing up. And I grew up. Wayne was also very rural in a lot of ways. Oh. And we lived on a on a dead end, and it was okay. like a pond and wood and my father raised homing pigeons and we had rabbits and dogs and chickens and all that kind of stuff so um, people that knew me growing up were actually pretty shocked when I when I was living in Hoboken in Manhattan because it just didn't wow. wasn't part of my my youth was it wasn't really that but there's there's definitely a part of that in me longing for that and um, Yes. I enjoy both both sides of things. Yeah, it's interesting because, like, I mean, I, I also, I, I live in Hoboken, and, 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 and but I kind of, like, uh, feel I wish I could spend more time in the country also. But, you know, the small town life is insular. 
because yeah. you get caught up in that provincialism. How ca is it any is it possible to have the best of both worlds? I mean, I don't know. Hoboken is kind of one of those in-between type places where you have it's it's sort of a little bit more low key. It's not so yeah. fast paced. And and where are you living now? And what's how do you like where you live now? I live about ten miles from here uh, in uh, Rutherford, okay. which is uh, close. It's convenient. It's a little more. It's definitely more suburban. I have a yard and a driveway, which is awesome. Okay. And because uh, the parking is so great here in, in town in Hoboken. Uh, and, you know, I, I just got married two years ago. I got a oh. Bambino on the way, first okay. one coming okay. in three very months. So Congratulations. Thank you. That's very exciting. Oh. Uh, very jazzed about that. Okay. Um, so, but th I think that's one of the, you know, Jersey gets knocked a lot, but yeah. uh, it's, yeah. it's one of the great things about Jersey is that you're here and within an hour, hour, two hours, there's, you got mountains to go skiing, you got the, the beach, you yes. got, uh, yes. you know, the Pinelands, you got farmland, it's, yeah. you got the Manhattan. There's so much that's so accessible within a really, sh relatively short distance. And, and uh, you know, knock Jersey all you want, but that's one of the best things about it. Very well put. Well, Jersey's coming on strong now, I think, in the national consciousness, even through TV shows like The Sopranos, you know, sort of put Jersey on the map. Uh, now, uh, closing, uh, in closing, uh, Joe, we always like to give our public hope for their own dreams and their own aesthetic aspirations. You know, people might be sitting on the couch watching us and dream of being an artist in their own lives. Can you give any, any words just from your own biography? how you made it as an artist because you've, you've created this beautiful work I don't know you know people could spend a lifetime and it's very difficult to, to be as talented and creative as you as you've done how, how did you do it and, and, and what advice would you have for others who want to follow their own creative dream I think a, a lot of it is a lot of anything and it's not just art is uh, a matter of it's very easy to have dreams or, or things you want to do and get intimidated by how much is involved with involved with doing it and a lot of times it's just a matter of giving it a shot going out there and trying doing it and a lot of times things are it just takes a little bit of research a little bit of blood sweat and tears uh, a phone, couple phone calls emails whatever oh. to get the ball rolling and um, take action yeah I, I, I think you know I think inaction breeds inaction mm. and action breeds action, you know, uh, whether it's in the direction you want it to go or whether it's, it's another direction entirely. Um, and, and a lot of it is if you're really doing what you want to do, uh, economically sometimes you just can't. Mm. But uh, I, I think it's always good to try and do it as, as much as you can. Family, yes. you know, you have kids, uh, work, and it gets in, in the way just time-wise. Right, and right. sometimes you can't pursue a lot of, a lot of the yes. daydreams that you think about. Yes. But um, Make the time, you know, okay. give it a shot, make, make the attempt, whether it's changing your careers or just doing something you always thought about doing. Um, make a little bucket list, you know? Okay, okay. okay. Do some of those things. Thank you, Joe. We're live on the Hoboken waterfront with artist Joe Borzada, a man whose images have brought aesthetic enrichment to the world and continue to do that, a man whose bars uh, were, were very social and humane and combined uh, a social experience with, with art and culture, the opposite of the, the, the 20 flat screen TV model that you see now proliferating throughout the society, which I think just, you know, adds to the alienation, a man whose, uh, you know, whose, whose bars have created wonderful dialogues and social experiences for people in the past, enriching people's lives. Your art enriches people's lives. I even see a spiritual dimension to all this. And we're so lucky to have you uh, on our show today, oh, Joseph. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure, John. Thank you. And Claudia. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So now what we like to do on our show is to conclude the show what we generally do is uh, we have some kind of reflection where I think about what what I learned um, and also uh, think about some things that I might want to add to the discussion maybe some questions or some content um, well just just think about where we are now I think it's a very beautiful place we're on the Hoboken waterfront and you can see the water the Manhattan skyline behind there. There's some beautiful green grass here. And um, I'm thinking right now about a philosopher named Maurice Merleau Ponty. And that got me thinking because Maxine Green, who is a philosopher of education who I uh, adore and who's influenced my pedagogy a lot, my thinking, also refers a lot to Merleau Ponty. 
And so I did a little research on Ponti this morning, a phenomenology of perception. So it focuses on what you're perceiving. And as you walk down the street, for example, you're looking around at the architecture, you're looking around at the trees and the people around you, you're perceiving these things, and you're making interpretations of that. And um, so I think for me, Merlu Ponti makes me more aware of what's happening in the world around me. I think when it comes to art, what I would like to do as a teacher is to liberate my students and my audience on the TV show to uh, trust in your own interpretation of a work, um, whether you're watching a film or whether you're reading a novel, to empower yourself to not be afraid to make a judgment on something and then to express that. In some cases, you know, it's beyond whether whether an interpretation is right or wrong, but it's just it's how you see it, how the situation is is to you based on your own background, based on your own biography. Uh, you're going to interpret a painting or you're going to interpret a, uh, a poem or a song in a slightly different way or a radically different way than I'm going to interpret it. But I think the fun part is in sharing and having discussion and dialogue. Um, so we're just very happy to be here bringing you art um, and we encourage people to learn more about art, whether it's formally by taking classes or whether it's, you know, doing your own private research. You certainly can read a lot of books on art that are out there. It is uh, a matter of interpretation or hermeneutics is another fancy word for interpretation. Uh, and these are things that you all can study. You know, you can go to college and you can major in hermeneutics and you can study phenomenology. You, you know, we're always adding to our knowledge and we hope that this uh, show is educative and we hope that you'll uh, somehow be inspired by something you hear or learn on this show. Even though it's not perfect, I want to model a human being thinking. And thank you very much for watching our show. A big thanks to my lovely wife Claudia who's filming me now without her love, without her support, without her uh, incredible dedication to this program it would not exist. She's our co-producer so uh, thank you again from the from the lively vibrant Hoboken waterfront. Uh, this is John Braden with the Public Voice Salon. Take care.